Take your Bibles. I invite you to turn with me to the book of Nahum this evening. The book of Nahum, the minor prophet. Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. Let me get it open there. These are the words of the living God. The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Father, we ask you now to bless the reading of your word. Lord, give me the, the wisdom that I need to proclaim it forth to your people. God, let it be a blessing to us and a help in this time in our country and in our, this age of, of, of the world. Lord God, that you would give us wisdom in how to deal with the things that are going on around us. We ask you to bless us now. In Christ's name, amen. All right, so Nahum is one of the minor prophets, and his prophecy that we have here, obviously, is one of judgment, and that's against the nation of Nineveh. So let's just situate him in time, because I find that it's very helpful if we can kind of place people on a timeline. It's always helpful to me. So Nahum was alive during the reign of Manasseh, the king of Judah, who reigned between about 686 B.C. to 642 B.C., and um, maybe that doesn't put it all together in a good timeline for you. Well, let's look at a little bit about Manasseh. And we've, we've had some good preaching, good teaching about Manasseh. Um, but we're just going to kind of give an overview because what we're going to talk about tonight is the God who judges the nations. And Nahum is an excellent book to look at in regard to this. But it's not just the book of, or the book of Nahum where he's judging Nineveh, but God judges all the nations. That's every nation. That's his nation, his chosen people, Israel. That's America. That's the Middle Eastern nations. That is all the Western nations. That's everybody in the Northern Hemisphere, the Southern Hemisphere. It doesn't matter where you are. You're not going to avoid God judging your nation. For better or for worse, he will judge. So let's look at Manasseh just a little bit, and let's get a, a bit of context about how God judges nations. Take your Bibles and look with me in 2 Kings 21. Hold that place in Nahum, though. In 2 Kings 21, we're going to find out that Manasseh, I think many of us know this, if we've been listening as some other preachers have preached a bit about Manasseh, we know that Manasseh was a wicked king, that Manasseh was not anybody that you wanted to model yourself after. Uh, in verse number 1 of chapter 21, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign and reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. So for 55 years, Manasseh had control in Jerusalem. And uh, we find that Manasseh was following after the abominations of the heathen. We're not going to read all of this chapter here, although it would benefit us to do that, but but for sake of time, we won't. So we see here in the text here in chapter 21 that he is um, he's rebuilding the high places that his father Hezekiah had torn down. That's the first thing. He rebuilt the altars to Baal for the worship and sacrifice to Baal. That's another thing. He made a grove as Ahab did and caused all the people to worship the hosts of heaven. That's the sun, the moon, the stars. In other words, Manasseh was taking the people of God and he was pointing them in a direction of ungodly idolatry as he was even pointing them to worship the sun, moon, and stars, the very thing that God put in the heaven to declare his glory, they are now worshiping the creation, what, rather than the creator. And that is the first issue here, that before Manasseh was able to get to building altars to Baal and doing all this, he had to pervert his perception of Jehovah. 
he had to go ahead and take Jehovah and set him aside and say, well, there are other gods. And these other gods of the nations are the ones that he decides to pursue, the ones that he decides to worship. So the very things that exist to, as a constant reminder of the maker are the things that he per, uh, pushes the people of Israel to worship. So Israel finds themselves like this time and time again, where they're constantly, I mean, Hezekiah, uh, what does Hezekiah do? He restores right worship. He's doing all this stuff right. He, I mean, he's, 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 he's standing as a righteous king and all these things. And, um, and, and all of a sudden, Manasseh comes along and he's doing all these unrighteous things. And it seems like Israel finds himself time and time again following after a wicked leader after wicked leader. And, and they lead them off into idolatry of the idols of the nations. They pursue those idols and they seem to constantly, note this, I want you to catch this. They seem to constantly be at war with peace. Does that make sense to you? They seem to constantly be at war with the idea of peace for, the, for themselves. In other words, um, there's a constant struggle in, in the nation. They're warring with righteousness over lawlessness. They find themselves in a position where there's peace, where there's rest, where there's the glory of God is abiding with them, where they have the power of God when they go out to fight their enemies, they're winning battles, they, they've got all of this, but they're constantly at war with the peace of God. They're fighting against it. And it's like during the time of Christ when piety, or in other words, a, a religious show, is, is at an all-time high with the Pharisees. That's not just a byproduct that we see in the New Testament, but that is something that constantly is a, is a recurring theme in the Old Testament where they are constantly finding themselves ebbing and flowing in and out of uh, religious piety that is just an external show and then a broken and contrite heart, which are the things that God seeks after. <clears throat> It's not just that Babylonian captivity that spurred the um, Pharisees, the, the sect of the Pharisees. That's where they come from. Yeah. It's not just that that spurred that, but it is a constant fight in the hearts of Israel. Look at Isaiah 58 real quick. This is kind of a picture in Isaiah 58 of what we're talking about. Remember, we're talking about God is the judge of the nations. Isaiah 58. I tend to say this verse here a whole lot when we're out street preaching. I won't say it at the volume that I say it out street preaching here. But Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 1, Cry loud and spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and shew my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. So Isaiah is told to cry loud, spare not in revealing the transgressions of the people. In other words, he's, he, he is given full liberty to expose every inch of transgression in Israel. Now, I would not every, want every inch of my transgression exposed to anybody. And I'd imagine that's where we all are. We're all in a position where we struggle with transgression, but... The, the dangerous thing, the deceitfulness of sin is that when we struggle with transgression, but we have an outward show of righteousness. In other words, I don't mean that we, we, um, we have trial after trial after trial, and then all of a sudden we succumb to a temptation, and, and that's when we, we fall into sin. I'm talking about when um, that's, that's the normal pattern for a Christian life. Trial, 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 and then you succumb to the temptation, and then you, you're into sin. When you've, when you've given yourself over to that. But what we're talking about here, what, what Isaiah is being commanded to describe, the transgression that he's being commanded to describe is this. Here, here's the state of the people. Verse number 2 of Isaiah 58. So he's told to cry aloud, spare not, lift the trumpet, uh, shew my people their transgression in the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily. Daily they seek the Lord. And he's told to declare their transgression. Notice this. And delight to know my ways. They rejoice in the law. Um, 
they rejoice in the righteousness of God. They rejoice in the glory of God in, in the things that they're commanded to do. As a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God, they are following the ordinances of God. Okay, They ask of me the ordinance of justice. They don't just follow him, but they ask, Lord, give us wisdom and understanding and how to execute justice. They take delight in approaching to God. They're, they're not just some wicked, evil nation like Nineveh was. Nineveh, as we'll see here shortly, is a vile nation. But this is the people of God, and here's what's happening. God says about them, they seek him daily, delight in his ways. Uh, as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God, they ask of me the ordinance of justice, take delight in approaching to me. Here's what he says in verse 3. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not. They've got the outward show. <clears throat> have we, wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge. Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure and exact all your labors. So he does not see, he does not acknowledge all of the outward deeds that they are doing because they are doing them in the state of a pretense of we will put on the outward show if we can have inward control. In other words, I will, and I use this word a lot, I will put on the facade outside. I will give you a nice picture if everything inside can be under my control, God. Yeah. That's the state of the nation of Israel here. Yeah. God, you get everything from the top out, but skin deep, that's all mine. Yeah. You don't get my heart. You don't get to sit on the throne of my heart, Lord. No, you don't, you don't get to rule and reign. In my, you don't get to help me with being a temperate person and slow to anger. You don't get to help me with making sure that my mind is focused. Like, my mind doesn't belong to you, but I will give you this outward show. And that's what they're giving. Notice verse 4. Behold, you fast for strife and debate. This is what their fast equals, strife and debate. And to smite with the fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Your fasting is not so that you can be heard on high. You are fasting for strife and uh, debate. It is such a fast that, is it such a fast that I have chosen what you're doing? No. A day for a man to afflict his soul. In other words, to put on this ascetic, this kind of self beating uh, outward uh, feign humility like oh just you know I, I'm no good and, and you know I'm just a dog and, th and this and that but actually you say all that but what you mean is I know that I'm good inside that's where Israel's at a day for a man to afflict his soul is it to, is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord in other words, you're giving yourself to the Sabbath, but you're really not giving yourself to the Sabbath. I remember it this way. There was a very religious man, a very pious man that I know, and I won't say his name. Some of you might know who he was. And when I was younger, I went out to eat with him. And I, I tend to be very hungry. Um, I don't know if you all are very hungry often, but I'm very hungry often. And so that's one thing. Let me confess my fault. I am probably a gluttonous man on occasion, and I need to walk, work on that. My wife tells me often. She was a little surprised today. She made me a sandwich, and she said, what else do you want? And I said, that's it. And she, was, she thought I was dying, but that's not the case. Thank God. Um, but anyways, um, I went off on a rabbit trail there. Forgive me. Um, so anyways... Uh, this idea of a fast for them is just them giving an outward show. Let me, let me regather my thoughts here. Uh, their day of fasting is so that they find pleasure. That's what it's for. It's an outward show. It's an outward desire to demonstrate to the people around them a sense of piety and religious, um, uh, religious authority that they really don't have inwardly. They're like slave drivers to other, while others while they afflict their own soul outwardly. But it's all vanity. So it reminds me a little bit of this. There was a man, and I went out to eat with him, and I was much younger. And um, we sat down at a restaurant, and I began to eat. 
And he said, excuse me, are you some kind of a heathen? I hope you choke to death. Now he, you know, I've had people tell me that jokingly, and I've heard people say that jokingly, but there was no joke in his voice. I mean, he was like asking God to send down fire and brimstone. He was like, you know, the sons of thunder. He was very unhappy that I did that. Very unhappy that I did that. And I was young. And I, we all need correction, amen? Some of you all have known me since I was little, and you know that I need a correction. But the fact of the matter is, is that he did that in a religious, pious spirit. He's out of church today. Doesn't go to church. Doesn't darken the church doors. Doesn't care for the things of God. I mean, he'll, he might, I've seen him on the Facebook. He might post a religious thing here and there, but he, don't, he won't go to church. What happened there? What happened there? That's a little picture of what happens to nations. There's an outward show, but there's no inward presence, inward power. Now, now I'm not saying he's not born again. I believe he's born again, but he's, right now he is fighting against the will of God in his life. And he is not in a place of joy if he's born again. He's in a place where he is suffering day by day. How many of you all have been out on God? And you remember that there was pleasure in sin for a season, but you were suffering even in your pleasure. You did not sleep well. And if you slept well, you did not wake well. That's where we are when there's just this piety, this religious piety that's on the outside. We don't need that. It brings judgment. It reminds me a little bit of Christians who go to restaurants on Sunday after church. And after they've been singing about amazing grace, all of a sudden grace has left their lips, left their hearts, left their minds, left their conscience. And all of a sudden, as soon as the waitress gets something wrong, it's, it's, it's their Nahum preaching judgment. Yeah. I mean, their Nahum saying that God has come to judge you and you will not live. So God's not interested in outward deeds until the inward man is right. He wants to see the outward deeds. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. But that's after we're in Christ Jesus. That is a byproduct. So it doesn't matter how many sacrifices you made if you weren't of a right heart and faith. Your labor was in vain. All of your work was in vain from the Old Testament till now. Amen. It didn't matter. Right. You could put on the best show, but judgment was coming. Yeah. Judgment is coming to a nation. Now, this is one type of the deceitfulness of sin found in the Old Testament. Israel's, and, um, you know, that is the deceitfulness of a sin that is just kind of hidden. It's a sin that is a secret sin. It is a sin with the outward religious piety, but now we're going to go to a different kind of sin. We're going to talk about a little bit of a different kind of sin. We're going to talk about the sin where Manasseh is not worried about an outward religious piety. What is Manasseh concerned with? He wants to please what? The flesh. He wants to please what? The people. He wants to please what? Himself. That's all he's concerned with. No, notice what's missing from there? The glory of God. If, if you could even take one, just one, one day to meditate on the glory of God and say, God, help me to be a vessel glory that glorifies your name today. You'll have a better day that day than you will any day of the week. Now, I'm not saying that it will be easier. It will probably be a lot harder. But you will have a better day spiritually than any day that week, any day that month, any day that year. I don't care if you win the lottery that Friday. You will have had a better day glorifying God for one day than you would on another day winning a million or, well, let's say $100 million because a million dollars ain't that much these days. You would because spiritual riches are greater than carnal riches. What kind of a treasure do you lay up when you are constantly living, not for God's glory, but for your pleasure? This is the treasure that is laid up. Now, note this. It is a treasure of judgment. Manasseh is leading them into all sorts of sin, building altars in the house of the Lord. 
taking what is God's place, in building altars for Baal. What is God's place in your life? If you're born again, God's throne is where? On your heart. In your heart. That's God's throne. Are you building altars where God's seat is? Are you building other altars to idols there? Are you sacrificing to other idols or to false idols? God forbid. The place where the name of the Lord is supposed to be, where the presence of God is supposed to be, erecting altars to idols, sacrificing to idols. God forbid it be named in the church. All this abomination is before the eyes of the Lord, but God is gracious. God is merciful. His mercies are new every day. He is long-suffering. And thank God that He is Let's just look at it here. Now, if you only read the book of Kings about Manasseh, you would, you would miss out on something really special. Second uh, Kings 21 and 17 says that the rest of the acts of Manasseh are recorded in Second Chronicles 33. And I want to turn there real quick. I'm going to exercise our fingers a little bit. Second Chronicles 33. In verse 9, So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err, and to do worse than the heathen. If you're a Christian and you live in sin, you're worse off than the heathen. If you're a Christian and you are dabbling in sin, I don't mean that you've stumbled and you have confessed it and you have... Uh, come back to God, you've repented, confessed your fault, your sin, and then you're fell in fellowship with God again. I mean, if you are just living in sin, you are in a worse position than the heathen. That's why there's only pleasure in sin for a season, but you don't rest. You won't rest in it. You won't enjoy it. You won't have peace. Notice this, Second Chronicles 33. Worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. He had an example. This is what happens when you rebel and you follow after idols. Your nation gets destroyed. Manasseh had the example. He knew the history. He wasn't ignorant. He was the son of a king. He knew the history. And the Lord spake to Manasseh, here's the grace of God though, and to his people, but they would not hearken. God is pursuing them. Verse 11, Wherefore the Lord brought upon the captains... Uh, upon them the captains of the hosts of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. That's God's grace. Right there, that's God's grace. God gave you a warning. He said, he spake to Manasseh and to the people, but they would not hearken, so God sent grace in the form of fetters, in the form of chains. Note this, you don't believe that's grace. I can tell some of you don't believe it. Look at this, verse 12. And when, his afflict, and when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his Father. Some of you might be in a trial right now and you think that God's abandoned you. Maybe God is putting you through a trial so that he can bring you to a place where you're humbled and seeking his face vehemently. Just because it's Wednesday night crowd don't mean somebody ain't here with the trial. I know it's the heartbeat of the church, but that doesn't mean that the heartbeat doesn't have trials. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord, verse 13, and prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him and heard his supplication. That's what the Lord wants. He wants his people to rely on him. And brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Note that. He didn't bring him back and say, no, 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 no. you got to start over. You're not the king anymore. He brought him back and placed him back on the throne. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. God proved himself. When's the last time that you even paid attention to the fact that God was proving himself to you? Yeah. 
When's the last time you watched that healing? I'm not talking about somebody getting their arm growing back like they're a lizard or something. I'm not talking about something like that. I'm not talking about first century uh, super instantaneous miraculous thing. I'm talking about the providence of God in your life where he takes a situation that there seemed to be no reasonable answer to and all of a sudden you don't have cancer anymore. Or all of a sudden, uh, the, the, the sickness that you had is gone away. Or all of a sudden, the anxiety that you were overwhelmed with is now overflown by peace in the Lord. Amen. He delivers. Amen. Sometimes He's gracious by letting your enemy capture you. But it's not about your circumstances in your life. It's rather the attitude you have in them. Manasseh could have just sat down in sackcloth and ashes and said, well, this is what I deserve. Woe is me. Who is it, the lepers? They said, uh, they had that attitude. Why sit we here and die? Yeah. What, what are we doing? Let's go. Let's do something. Sometimes we get so depressed and so overcome with anxiety and the troubles and the cares of life and maybe we're captured by the enemy uh, in a metaphorical sense and, and all of a sudden we're just depressed and despair and all this. And all God wants us to do is call on Him. Amen. This change in Manasseh enacts a change in Jerusalem. There He builds a wall in the west of Gihon. He established military posts throughout all the fenced cities of Judah. He took away the idols out of the house of the Lord and threw them like trash outside the city, almost as if they were to be warnings for anybody else who was an idolater, any Gentile who had come or a Jew who had been away and had come back with their idols that they had. Um, and they come and they see all the idols are thrown as trash there at the gate of the city. What a picture of the believer that when... God puts us in our rightful place because we've put him in his rightful place. Or excuse me, we've acknowledged his rightful place. Let me say it that way. Once we've acknowledged his rightful place, all of a sudden the idols get thrown outside. All of a sudden there's a testimony of what God has done in us. He rebuilds the altar of Jehovah and reestablishes the right sacrifices. And it seems, here's where we're going to get back to Nineveh, that around this time of revitalization, of true worship and obedience to God, somewhere in there, around 650 B.C., they say, God calls a prophet named Nahum. So after Jerusalem has been revitalized and everything is back in order, it seems right around about there that as God has given grace to Israel and is restoring them and bringing them back to a position of blessing... Now he sends out his judgment to another nation. Now we don't know much about Nahum except that he was an Elkishite. And um, that means a bunch of stuff that we don't know because we cannot find that place. But the Bible said it exists, so guess what? It exists. It exists. So that much we know. And that Nahum was called by God to declare judgment on Nineveh, that great Assyrian city. He's the second prophet to go to Nineveh. I got a dollar to any kid who can tell me who the first one was. According to the Greek historian uh, Diodorus Siculus, Nineveh had walls that were around 100 feet high with 1,500 defense towers surrounding the city that were about 200 feet tall. And they were surrounded by a moat that was massive. I think it was about 150 feet wide by 60 feet deep. Some of you all would like that. Some of the neighbors we have sometimes. The Assyrians in Nineveh prided themselves on having an impenetrable city. Some of the walls were as thick as 49 feet. 49 feet. I'm talking insulation, baby. That's a good heat and air bill. I just got mine today. I'm, I'm really not impressed. They were an incredibly cruel people by all accounts. Remember we talked about the cruelty of who on Sunday night? Pop quiz. Pilot. The cruelty of... Pilate. 
They would cut off limbs and gouge out eyeballs and cut off fingers and toes and tongues and all of these wonderful things that they thought were just normal. All of these horrible things, I should say. And the Lord says through his prophet in Nahum chapter 3 and 19, there at the end he says, For upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? In other words, there was no nation that they had come into contact contact with that had not experienced affliction from them. And God, who once extended mercy to this Gentile nation, is now ready to give them over to judgment. Remember that. God had extended mercy through Jonah. A hundred years before this, God had given mercy to them through Jonah. He had blessed them. He had sent them an opportunity to repent. He had sent them an opportunity to turn away from their wickedness. Jonah walked for, what, three days through that city? Preaching? What was it, low 40 days? And God's going to destroy Nineveh? They repent. But now they're back into sin. Between that time and this time, they have defeated the northern kingdoms. They have come against the people of God whom, from whom came the message that delivered them from the original judgment of God. And now they're back in sin. There's a lot of typology here for our current time. I'm reminded of the great awakening, of, of the great revivals that passed through this nation and how this nation was stirred and how the Lord had free reign in this nation and how God moved and, and many people were born again through the preaching of the gospel. Amen. Who is it? Jonathan Edwards or David Brainerd or one of those men and they stand up and they preach and, and all of a sudden the world, uh, the, the, the continent of America is lit on fire with the gospel. And there's a time of blessing from God. There's a time of repentance. There's a time of uh, uh, revival and all of this. But what happens? Sin creeps back in. The nations run after idols. The prophet begins, this is the judgment of God. The prophet begins by telling of the Lord mighty. Nahum chapter 1 again. God is jealous, verse 2. And the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. How many of you all know an angry person? Just raise your hands. If it's you, then raise your hands twice. <laughs> I know some angry people. The Bible says not to make friendship with an angry person. Stay away from him. There's destruction there. There's disaster there. But God is angry in a way that is so righteous and holy that note what it says about God. That even though he is jealous and he is angry and he is vengeful and he is full of wrath and indignation, fiery consumption, our God is a consuming fire. Note this in verse number three. The Lord is slow to anger. And great in power. In other words, even though he has the ability to step on you like an ant, he is slow to anger. He has sent you Jonah. Jonah has come to you and proclaimed a message of deliverance and repentance. And you have believed that. Yet in spite of the fact that you experienced some blessing from God, you have now decided that you will go along without God and get it done all on your own. And they went from a, p a place that was uh, devoid of bloodshed and blood guilt and all of this wicked violence. Uh, idolatry and all of those things to a place that was filling back up with it. Amen. It says later on, I, I don't have the, the, the particular passage here, but it says um, verse number 3 of, of chapter 3, the horsemen lift up 
lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses, and there is none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts. In other words, people would walk through the streets and have to step over dead bodies because they were such a violent and vile nation who had just a hundred years prior experienced the blessing of a revival, of repentance, of salvation, and now they are in a path of unrighteousness that leads them to a path of judgment. I want to bring these three things to your attention and then we're going to, we're going to hit two other little short texts if, if time allows and then we'll, we'll be done. In verse 11 of chapter 1, here are... Well, let me bring four things to your attention. I'm going to learn to count one day. Four things. Verse 11 of chapter 1. There is one that come... There is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. That word wicked is literally a counselor of Belial. In other words, a messenger of Satan. They are directed by people who are influenced and who receive counsel from Satan, from Lucifer, from the devil and his hordes. The second thing here, chapter number 3 and verse 1. We've already touched on this a little bit, but we'll hit it again. Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. They pray, uh, the prey departeth not. In other words, the prey cannot get away. They are encompassed so great. Remember, 1,500, um, 1500 towers where they would have uh, guards at. 100 foot walls, 200 foot towers, 50 foot thick in some spots. There's nowhere for people to go who they have brought captive in there. There's no, this is the escape room that you're not getting out of. It's as impenetrable as it is to get inside, it is impossible to escape. And they brought people there for the purpose of torture and mutilation and to destroy them for sport. There is no the prey departeth not. The noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots. The horseman lifteth up both the bright sword. That's what we just read a second ago. There's carcasses all over. They're a violent place. Verse 4 talks about, and we hit this, but we're going we're gonna to explain it. Their spiritual harlotry. Verse 4, read it again with me. The because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms. In other words, their goal was to go out and pervert as many nations as they could because they were operating under a witch. They have wicked counselors, they have wicked deeds, and they produce wicked offspring. America is in trouble. Sometimes it's not popular, some of the scriptures that we find in the text of the Bible... Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 5. This is a picture. The great and terrible day of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 3. For behold the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water, the mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet and the prudent and the ancient, 
the captain of fifty and the honorable man and the counselor and the cunning artificer and the eloquent orator and I will give children to be their princes and babes shall rule over them. If this is a picture of any other nation aside from Jerusalem at this time, Israel at this time, it's a picture of America. Children rule America. When I was younger, I would get up early in the morning and around 4.30 and my mom would be awake already because that was her custom because she hated sleep, apparently. And um, it, would, it would wake me up and I would go into the living room and we would sit down on our old little console TV. Some of you don't know what that is because you're too young. Some of you are surprised that I know what that is. <laughs> and watch things like Mary Tyler Moore, which I'm going to just say was not a holy show. But we'd watch things like that. And we'd watch things like, what's the other one with the, hey, what's that guy? I don't know his name. The Fonzie, yeah. Or Fonzie, not the Fonzie. It's like the Walmart. <clears throat> Some of you all go to the Walmart more than you should. Um... But there was a beginning to be a turn in the culture. Pastor Lawson talks about you get back to the black and white and you're doing a lot better. I mean, you're not, you're not holy and righteous, but you're doing a lot better. And I, and I realized, and I thought about it, I was, I was watching an episode of Leave it to Beaver. Is that what it's called? Leave it to Beaver once. And you're all like, hey, what's this got to do with the Bible? Just wait, I'm, I'm going to tie a point in here. And in Leave it to Beaver, Wally and Beaver whatever his other name is, I guess it's just Beaver. Wally and, and the younger brother, they're always getting into mischief. But you know who always looks outstanding and righteous and just and gracious and loving in that show? Mr. and Mrs. Cleaver. Do you know what Mr. and Mrs. Cleaver look like today? Well, Mr. Cleaver drinks beer. And he doesn't know how to get off the couch. And his belly impedes him from being able to see his toes. And he slurs and he stumbles. And he cannot open pickle jars for some reason. Even though he weighs more than he should. He's a very big man, but he's very weak. And Mrs. Cleaver, well, she is the most brilliant person on the show... And she's constantly helping her husband to see how stupid he is. And on top of that, the children know that both of them are morons. And they run everything. If your kids are watching shows like that, I've seen it in my own children. They get a perspective like all of a sudden, oh, kids are in charge. You know, it's one thing when it's the little rascals and they get one up on the naughty dog pound guy, you know, and he's going to kill the dog and they get one up on him, but he's the bad guy. But when the parents who are not the bad guys are made to look like fools, we have a nation where the children rule. And the people shall be oppressed, every one by another and every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient and the base against the honorable. Even liberal atheist comedians are seeing this. They're talking about children who curse at their parents and their parents are just like, what can I do? I mean, I can't hit them. They're my kid. And I'm like, no, they are your kid. You're supposed to hit them. That's going to get taken out of context now. Right. Isaiah 3, we see women and children out of order. We see that as for my people, children are their oppressors, chapter Three and verse 12, and women rule over them. Women are wonderful and magnificent creatures. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. They, are, they are, in my opinion, the best part of humanity. Right. But God has set in order that men need to step up and be men and rule. Amen. And women need to stay in their place. This is not popular. I know. Don't throw a hymnal at me. I, I beg of you. 
And I know there are special circumstances in the Bible when a woman stood up and did something because men were too weak and beggarly and feminine to be men. Too caught up in sin to be men. But the order is that the men take charge and the women are who are protected, provided. They, have, they act as priests to the women. That's your role, men. Women, it's not your role to be the protector and the provider and the priest. We know that there are positions where women are put in where they have to take care of their children by themselves through some horrific tragedy or maybe some messy divorce or one situation or another. But that's not God's order. This is a picture of a nation that's in trouble because the children make fools of everybody. They are the princes. Everybody looks to them and, and feeds their needs. And the women are in charge. That's what we have in America. There are two kinds of deceitful sins that will lead a nation astray. The deceitful sin that says, I can get away with it and just does it out loud like Manasseh. They just do it out loud like um, Nineveh. And then there's the one where they do it inside their hearts. I'm going to challenge you. I've said some things that are a little bit controversial tonight. Check me out. Is it the Word of God? Amen. If it is, are you in submission to the Word of God? Am I in submission to the Word? That's the, that's the litmus test. It's not, this is what the denomination allows. If we were worried about what the denomination allowed, look at the Southern Baptist Convention. Pretty soon, the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, if maybe the man Tom Askell, who is, who is pursuing the office, if someone who is a, 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 one of the members of the Founders Group, some of you have no clue what I'm talking about, but somebody who's trying to bring them back to a more biblical point of view trying to center things on the Word of God and not CRT and, you know, all of this, um, all of these equivocations that the church is making, then pretty soon they'll just be, they'll, they'll have a trans man or woman or thing as the next president. Not just the Methodists anymore, it's the Baptists. We used to get mad at the Southern Baptists because they were too... Contemporary, they, they played contemporary Christian music and, and all of these things. And I don't know, maybe some of the old timers were right that that was a slippery slope. But what we need to worry about is not the Southern Baptist Convention, not the Methodists, not the Presbyterians. We need to worry about our own hearts and our own congregation. Tribulation and trials will come. Israel faced them time and time again. This church has been through many trials and God has preserved it. In the typology of the church, this church being like a little nation, we have to keep in the priority these three things, and I'm going to close. One, we have to keep in priority the true God. Number two, we have to keep in priority sound doctrine. Yeah. And number three, we need to be good disciples. Yeah. Yes. You can believe that there is one God and that's okay. The devil's believing tremble. You can have a aura of, or excuse me, a, a, a document that says you've got sound doctrine just like the Southern Baptist Convic Convention, they're all confession. They're not confessional, but they have their confession. I guess they are confessional. They have their confession of faith that each church has to assign to, and you can say all the right things, or you can just be doers, and you can be like the liberal churches, and they do all these wonderful things. They feed people, they clothe people, they do all these great humanitarian things, and that's wonderful. But if you're missing any of those three elements, you don't have the full package. You need a sound deity. You need to know who God is. You need sound doctrine. You need to know how to live. And you need sound disciples. You need to know 
that you need to live what you know how to live right. That's what temple needs. And I think we have that. But we need to preserve it. Fight to preserve it. It is so simple for a nation to rise and fall and rise and fall. We see that time and time again. How much easier is it for the devil to mess around with 300 people? Or 250 people or 400 people? May we never lose sight of the glory of God and the labor in His field. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that you have given us such wonderful examples in Scripture. God, both of what to do and what not to do. Lord, you have blessed me through this study. And God, I pray that you took my stumbling lips, Lord, and you made it clear to the people. Father, that they see, Lord, that we need to pursue you. God, we cannot get lazy in our pursuit of the things of of Christ, of the things of God. But Lord, we need to magnify you day by day in our walk. Father, and let us be walking diligently, not just trudging along, but God, but I mean, I want to be power walking. Father, I pray that you would bless us now as we take these requests, Father, and we send them to your throne. Lord, understanding that you hear, we are heard. Father, we bless your name now. We ask it in Christ. Amen.